uh, Southwestern, thank you for Western Hills, thank you for mm-hmm. First Christian, thank you for uh, leaders that are interested and invested into uh, your kingdom and want to get better. Lord, forgive us when we become complacent as a mm-hmm. leadership and as a church. Forgive us when we treat uh, your holy bride as something that is uh, ordinary or something we do when we have time to do it. Lord, let mm-hmm. it be a priority in our hearts. Let it be a passion in what we do and take very seriously the responsibility we're given and understand the accountability that we have uh, yes. to you after mm-hmm. we're finished serving here on earth. And so, Father, we just we just want to be done the best we can. We're all flawed people, but mm-hmm. uh, we want to do the best we can so that we stand before you and hear uh, the well done, good and faithful servant. And so, bless this day, guide mm-hmm. us in, in all that we study, and may may we grow in you. In your Please, mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you, Jeff, very much. It's good to be back, and uh, I, I want to uh, just tell you about the doing. So we're going to be looking at this issue of what's next. Uh, What we need to be thinking of, we are past the pandemic and we cannot be thinking uh, in terms of, hey, I want to go back to normal. Normal is not back there and we need to be looking ahead. So what we're going to do, we're going to have five talks before we drive away this afternoon and I promise you we are driving away. We have a hard stop at three o'clock. We will be done we got a great lunch time and it's you're going to be talking with one another at the end of these talks they're going to be discussion questions so um, case in point what we're going to do this first one is going to explain how do we change our minds so that we're asking and thinking what's next every leader needs to be thinking that way then at the end of that you'll have some time for discussion Then we're going to take a bio break, coffee break, get some more of those vitamins over there that are glazed and got to have a daily vitamin. Then we're going to come back and we have four other topics that are very relevant to life today. We're going to talk about what's next with next generation. How do we reach and keep children and teenagers in Jesus because we are losing them left and right to the culture. That's very timely. We're going to talk about what's next for staying on mission. We're going to do that right after lunch uh, and talk about how do we stay in the lane on evangelism and discipleship. Great commission. We are going to talk about what's next for finding and keeping staff. How do we find ministers when the pipeline is empty? How do we find staff when there are no staff to hire? But once we hire them, how do we keep them? It's very timely today. And then finally, we're going to talk about what's next when it comes to money, specifically giving. Because right now, with what's happening in our economy, uh, churches are feeling Uh, a pinch. We'll talk all about that. So we're going to talk about relevant issues today. This is not just something that's pie in the sky kind of stuff. It is to have direct, immediate application to ministry in the church. Now, if you listen better standing, feel free to stand. Whatever is uh, good for you, this is a day of casual uh, encouragement and learning, okay? Uh, And Jeff has arranged for Charles to record this because there were some who could not attend due to schedule conflicts, but they requested the material. So, box is being video recorded. And Charles, are you getting a signal back there? Are we good to go? Okay. And um, all right. So let's talk about this uh, first topic. What's next? in terms of our thinking. Now, last year, if you were with us, I gave you this bell uh, uh, curve. But those who are new, just very quickly, to help us understand the urgency of the hour. The American church has a bell curve. There's a church uh, launch date when it's birthed. And then there's momentum, excitement. But soon the the new wears off. That that new wears off and growth then has to become strategic if we're going to hit on all eight cylinders at a place of sustained health. Now, regretfully, the majority of churches today are on the wrong side of the bell curve. Many churches in America are maintaining, they maintain attendance, they maintain offering, they maintain interest, uh, and some are even on life support. They don't know if they're going to be open at the end of the month, let alone at the end of the year. And then, regretfully, 12 churches now are closing every day in America. 
12 churches are closing every day. What we want to understand is uh, out of 350 to 375,000 Protestant churches, 85% of them are on the wrong side of the bell curve. Also, just again, why, we, why, why we're even having this seminar, and I want to thank First Church for putting it together. We, we have some real challenges in front of us. I'm going to just bring them up here on this blackboard, so to speak. Progressive Christianity is very real. Uh, progressive Christianity is that movement in our country where people are not believing in the inspiration, the inerrancy, the infallibility of the Word of God. They've thrown out unchanging truth just to be cultural today. Uh, cultural Christianity, as a result, uh, is uh, being accepted by many young people and other individuals over being biblical Christians. So how a preacher communicate uh, for example, a sexual ethic integrity in a culture that is out of control sexually. And many people in the church are buying into being a cultural Christian rather than a biblical Christian. We uh, were struggling with getting people to grow up in the Word of God. How can they become like Jesus if they are biblically illiterate? and illiteracy uh, is only increasing. There's passive evangelism, meaning churches are growing by transfer, not by deliberate conversion. And there is lukewarm discipleship. People are not becoming more mature in Christ. We're gonna really nail that one in, in just a little while. Likewise, we're going to unpack this. We're failing to reach and keep the next generation. More people who are raised in the church are now leaving the church than staying in the church by age 29. So we have to unpack that. There's a spiritual cancer of uh, consumer-driven Christianity. What are you going to do for me at First Church or wherever? Uh, because there's a shinier uh, church down the road. There, there's something better just across town. And what we find is people want to be waited on hand and foot rather than be servants of Jesus. Uh, we have a, an empty leadership pipeline. Uh, more on that a little bit later. And we have to just admit that our country is fundamentally broken. Uh, Indianapolis, where I live, we are setting uh, a new record for the third year in a row for the number of murders in our city homicides. As a matter of fact, when we just look at America, there's not a day that goes by that we do not hear of a mass shooting somewhere in America. It's just commonplace. We are fundamentally broken. Our government is dysfunctional uh, because of the growing schism between the parties politically, uh, and, and we're just broken. So the hope of our country is the church, not higher education, not corporate America, uh, not certainly the government. The hope of America is the church. So your community needs you at your best. Our community needs us at our best. Uh, the day is urgent. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about what's next. I shared this picture last year. This is the coat of arms of Australia. And in the early 1900s, when that country formed, the leaders said, here's our seal, our coat of arms, a kangaroo and an emu. They chose that specifically because those indigenous animals cannot move backwards. A picture speaks a thousand words, so they're telling their people it's forward only. Now, Paul in Philippians 3, he said in verse 13, this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which the Lord has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus, going on in verse 14. And when you and I encounter people in the church, oh, I want to do things like we did back whenever, you got to say, no. Uh, in the spirit of the Apostle Paul, we're going to forget what's behind and we're going to strain toward what is ahead, pressing on. These are new days, the likes of which we have never had. 
and we need to lead with a what's next mind. Now, so what we're going to do uh, is just capture here for a moment what Jesus said. Matthew 17, when Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think? Simon, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own sons or from others? And then over in Matthew 18, what do you think? There he goes again, posing a question. What do you think? There was a, if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for that one that wandered off? What do you think? Oh, but check this out. Here it comes again, Matthew 21. What do you think? There was a man with two sons. And not only in Matthew 21, 28, but check this out one more time. In Matthew chapter 22, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? What does he want us to do? He wants us to think. And all too often, we are not thinking about what's next. We are dwelling in the moment. We are in crisis management in the moment, or we are waxing uh, longingly for the past. Jesus wants us to use our mind. Here's uh, Thomas Edison, and this uh, gentleman... Um, I had a winter home in Florida, Fort Myers, maybe you've been there. He had this dock going out into the water when he was there fishing. Nobody could step foot on the dock while he was out there fishing, not even Mrs. Edison. And many a time he didn't catch fish because he didn't bait the hook. He wanted time to sit and think. This is the guy who said 5% of people think, 10% of people think they think, and the other 85% would rather die than think. Today we're going to think about what's next. And if we're not stirred mentally in this regard, then I have failed you today. Something's gotta happen in our mind. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna use Simon Sinek, his template. If you're not familiar, please go to ted.com and watch his golden circle theory. He even wrote a book called Start With Why as a result. And his theory is companies organizations, even churches, they start from the outside and they know what they do. Hey, we're having worship tomorrow. Hey, we're having a seminar today. Hey, we're doing this. They know what they do. We have Sunday school. We have youth group. Some people can tell you how they do what they do, but only a meager handful can tell you why. And the organizations that start with why and then move out are changing the world. So what we're going to do, we're going to start with why and talk about why should we think this way? Why should we ask and think what's next? And there are, three, there are going to be three things we unpack. First of all, it's biblical. Having that kind of a mind is biblical. It is logical. And it is essential. Now I'm going to unpack each one of those reasons why we need to be sure we are thinking and asking what's next. Now, biblical. Think with me for a moment. The Bible is full of what I call Kodak moments. Anybody remember when a camera had film in it and Kodak made the film? And we would take a picture and then we would run it over to Walmart or Walgreens or whatever, drop it in an envelope and wait for three days to get our pictures back. And if something was worth a picture, we called it a what? A Kodak moment. Well, here's some Kodak moments in Scripture of what I think is what's next thinking. When we look at Noah and the ark, he had to be thinking, what's next? I got to cut some trees. I got to hew the lumber. I got to figure out how I'm going to assemble it. I have to figure out how I'm going to make this water tight. I got to figure out how I'm going to give fresh water to these animals. I got to figure out how I'm going to feed them. If you haven't been to the uh, ark in uh, uh, Ohio, uh, it's well worth the drive to go through uh, Noah's Ark by Genesis Ministries. Uh, Joseph in Genesis, uh, feast and then famine. He had to figure out how do I plant, how do I harvest the crops, where do I store them, when do I build, and where do I build the storehouses, how do I develop an accounting system in order to make the grain last for seven years of the worst famine ever to be uh, on planet Earth. He's always thinking, what's next? There's another Kodak moment in the Word of God. Uh, Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the walls. Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem. He looks at the debris field, and he's thinking, what's 
I got to get these walls rebuilt uh, as quickly as possible. We look in the New Testament, Jesus and his mission. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Acts 1 verse 8, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So you start in Jerusalem, then what's next? You go to Judea, then what's next? You go to Samaria, and then what's next? You go to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus gave this, this uh, mission. Great commission. You're going to make disciples of all nations. What do you start with? You immerse them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You convert them. You reach them. And then what's step two? What do you do next? Then you disciple them, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. So there's what's next thinking from our Savior. And then even the creation of the universe. Genesis chapter 1. Day 1. Let there be light. And if you and I will study going through the days of creation were sequential. They were incredibly appropriate, and I believe firmly in 24 literal days, 24 hour days, excuse me, hours, and they were sequential. And, and in whose image have we been made? God's. So if you get pushed back in your church, oh, this is a waste of time, I go, uh, it's right here in the good book. This discipline of thinking what's next should be a skill of every leader. It's biblical. And not only that, but it's logical. It's logical in that in Genesis 1, as I said, we have been made in God's image and God was very strategic in his thinking. Jesus, night before he goes to the cross, John 17 verse 4. He says, Father, I have completed, uh, or I brought you glory here on earth by completing the work you sent me to do. And that was sequential. Come, be born, grow up uh, into a man of God. And then he went out teaching, he went out preaching, he performed miracles, he got to the cross, he was killed, buried, raised from the dead. He, uh, he, he is terms of what's next and we have been made in their image and it's essential first chronicles 12 32 very very easy to understand sons of issachar had minds to understand the times and they knew what israel should do 200 chiefs with their families under their command so what we find there is we should have this discipline it's essential of thinking what's next let me i'm going to give you an example at e2 we this is in our dna when we observed that our schools have fewer and fewer students fewer people uh, attending uh, when we discover that uh, there are fewer people becoming children's ministers student ministers preachers etc then what we have discovered is that Come right on in. There's plenty of room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, uh, our, hundreds of churches that close uh, soon. Here, let's just move this down for you guys. Okay, there you go. Thank Feel you. free to stretch out. Okay, there you go. Uh, fewer fewer churches are going to be able to find somebody. So what we did with a mind to understand the times, we wrote a book called The Preaching Elder. And in this book, there are 14 videos. And these 14 videos help elders learn how to preach and deliver a message. So at E2, with a mind to understand the times, we have determined this is something that we have to provide the local church. All right, so uh, it's biblical, it's logical, it's, it, it's essential. Now the how. Let's talk about the how. And what we're going to do, we're going to look around, we're going to look within, and we're going to look ahead. All right, so how. We know why we have to think and ask what's next. How do we actually do that? Well, we're going to look around, we're going to look within, we're going to look ahead. Now, when we look around, what we need to understand is we need to look around uh, our community where it is that we're serving. So where our church is planted, we have to look around there and see what is happening. This is a Karen. 
C-A-I-R-N, Karen, we, I climb a lot of mountains, and when the trail disappears, you look for Karens. Stacks of rock, and they'll take you to the summit. You just follow the Karens. Well, what I want to do is uh, teach you there are seven questions that you and I ask, and they take us to a place of understanding what's going on around us. So as a pastor of a church, an elder of a church, I'm going to be asked these seven questions. I memorized them long ago, and it's just the way I think. And here they come. If I'm going to be doing what's next in the local church, I'm going to ask what's happening culturally in my community. That was a part of our lunch conversation yesterday. We talked about the multi-ethnic culture of Clinton, Oklahoma how it's broken down in terms of different ethnicities. See, you're looking around, but also that word culturally means, is our community increasing in number? Is the population growing? Has the population plateaued? Are people moving away from our community? Are we declining in population? What's happening culturally? Across the street from our building is our high school. There are about 4,000 students in our high school. 30 other languages are spoken in that high school as the mother tongue of the students. I better know that because that's a part of our community, what's happening in our community. What's happening educationally uh, in our church, but also outside of the church? What's happening educationally? I can tell you right now that uh, literacy rates among Americans are declining. People are reading at the fifth grade, sixth grade reading level in America. So that means the screen, not everybody understand them. And that affects how we do ministry, what's happening educationally. And all of us know that there is a real woke element moving into public education. What are we going to do in order to help our children who are in public education uh, process that? Because children are growing up in their minds. When they see a boy wearing a dress or doing his nails in their fifth grade class, that has to somehow be explained by a mom or a dad to that child so that they are not confused. These are to totally different days that we are doing ministry in. So what's happening educationally? What's happening technologically? Uh, if my church is not technologically advancing, we are going to be utterly ir what? irrelevant. We're going to be utterly irrelevant if we do not have a website that can be downloaded or opened on a phone. Utterly irrelevant. If we are incapable of receiving offerings digitally, we are utterly irrelevant. All we have to do is look around us and see the movement of technology and then ask ourselves, are we able to connect with our mission field uh, technologically? Vocationally, what's happening? Are we having people move away from the community because they can't find jobs? Is this great resignation where an estimated one out of every two Americans will change jobs within 18 months? Is that affecting us in our community? What's happening vocationally? What's happening economically? This is huge. We should be looking now. Inflation rate in 40 years. The COLA Social Security cost of living adjustment came out two weeks ago, 8.7%, the highest ever. Uh, when we look at uh, the cost of food, the cost of utilities, it's going to impact giving because giving to uh, nonprofits is impacted by what's happening economically. And we should, as leaders, be thinking about the asking what's, what's going on. What's happening relationally? What's going on relationally around us in our community? Do men marry men? Women marry women? Uh, what's happening relationally to the, the family unit? Is divorce uh, a, a very real issue? Relationally, are grandparents raising grandchildren? 
Have they gotten legal custody of their grandchildren? And now we have exhausted grandparents who are doing it all over again, the raising. What's happening relationally? We should be asking that question. And finally, what's happening spiritually? Oops, let me go back. What's happening spiritually? Uh, what's going on in our community? Do we have evidence of other religions? Within just uh, three miles of the creek, we have a Sikh, S-I-H-K, temple. And this is a form of uh, Hinduism. And our community has one of the largest Sikh populations in Indiana living within miles of the creek. So these men who wear turbans and have long beards, it's very common to see Sikhs. And we should, I should be uh, learning about that and trying to uh, equip our people to have uh, connections with that community. So when looking around, ask and uh, answer the questions that are here and we're going to be able to understand what our next steps are. Now looking within, this is looking within the church. But not only within the church, looking within the ministry. So when we look inside E2, we ask three questions. Ready? Three questions. What attitudes need to change? What attitudes need to change? What actions need to take place? What actions need to take place? And then finally, what announcements need to be made? Let me give you an example. This is a real-time example from the creek, uh, Indian Creek Christian Church in Indianapolis, where I served as a lead minister for 30 years, the creek, and I'm an elder there. Now, uh, my successor, my pastor, his name is Dan, and, and the creek's a very large church. We, he's taking us through 1 Corinthians, verse by verse, for eight months. And the series is called Dear Church. Well, when we came up to chapter 5, we knew that we were going to get into the topic of sexuality. Chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, marriage, divorce. Hence, Dan and his team, they said... What we're going to do, we're going to sit in those three chapters for nine weeks. And we're going to go deep on the topics of human sexuality and relationships because that's a huge part of the American culture right now. Hence, we have had messages on gender dysphoria. We've had messages on homosexuality, messages on pornography, messages on cohabiting, messages on divorce and remarriage, messages on being single, messages on how do I find a mate in an ungodly culture, a godly mate in an ungodly culture. And the messages have been phenomenal. Now, showing compassion without compromising our belief in the unchanging Word of God. We knew, Dan knew, the elders knew that attitudes needed to change towards people who are very broken. When that fifth grader comes to women marry or two men marry, something went wrong. But yet in American uh, Christianity, we're quick to pass what? Judgment. judgment. Oh, you're going to burn like a twig someday. We pass judgment and attitudes need to change. It does not mean that we completely... There's that old saying, we have to hate the sin but love the sinner. That's very true. But we need to really live that out. Hence, before we started these nine weeks of messages, attitudes needed to be addressed in the church family. Will we love people unconditionally? Uh, Jesus, rich young ruler, Mark chapter uh, uh, 9, 10, thereabouts. He encounters the rich young ruler, and uh, when he sees him, he already knows he's going to reject him. Hey, talk to the hand, Jesus. Not interested. He's going to walk away because of his great wealth. But Jesus, being fully and completely who? God, already knew that the young man was going to walk away. And it says in the text, Jesus looked at him and 
and loved him. I believe it's chapter 9 or 10, verse 21. He looked at him and loved him. And so when we see people who do not look like us, act like us, live like us, think like us, believe like us, if we're a follower of Jesus, we need to look at them and what? Love them. Love them. Well, that attitude needed to be changed. And that had to take place before these sermons could be preached, what actions had to, what was going to happen. But even before one sermon was preached in that nine-week series, announcements were made. And it wasn't just, hey, everybody, uh, make sure you understand that uh, the, the, the content for the next nine weeks is going to be incredibly sensitive. So parents, you might want to think twice about bringing your children into the service. Take them, please, to children's ministry. There were signs everywhere. There were announcements made videography-wise on the website, on our social media platforms, but also an announcement that was made. Everybody who was an elder, everybody who led a life group, everybody who's a, a person of influence at the creek in terms of mentoring, it was required of us to attend a 90-minute workshop to help us answer questions that most assuredly were going to come up. And so there was a thorough, thorough communication of that. So the reason I bring this up, whatever you're thinking in terms of what's next for inside the church, remodeling, redecorating. Uh, perfect example here at First Christian, your new worship uh, uh, setting. What attitudes needed to be changed? See, there were some, well, isn't this good enough? Why do we need to change this? What attitudes needed to be changed? And then what actions needed to be taken? And what kind of communication had to be a part of that? This is, this is not rocket science. This is so simple. And then finally, looking ahead. This is all about strategic planning. Without vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. We have to be strategic planning. VMV, vision, mission, values. Here's vision, hope changes everything, mission, and values. This is the identity, the identity of a church. A three-year strategic plan is a direction. VMV is who we are. A three-year plan is where we're going. So Betty Crocker here, uh, she was introduced in 1927, and Betty has changed eight times. What stands out about Benny, uh, Betty? Anybody? Red. Loves red. Trimmed in white. Red trimmed in white. And she's always what when it comes to her hair? A... A brunette. She's never a redhead. She doesn't have black hair. She's not a bleach blonde. She's always a brunette. But here's the key. She always maintains her essence, but she's relevant to the year in which she's being presented. That's what this is. You have to be thinking, if we're going to move the church forward, our DNA, our spiritual DNA doesn't change. How we present who we are to the community has to be relevant has to be relevant. Same thing. Let's, let's go to the guys. A vet. It was introduced in 1953. That means next year is its 70th anniversary. For 70 years, it's always been a two-seater. I have yet to see a Corvette with a back seat where a, a child's uh, uh, child carrier can be. It's always a two-seater. It's always a high-performance engine. If they put an electric motor in that thing, they're going to uh, probably have some backlash. It's, it's never a four-cylinder. It's a high-performance engine, and it is always expensive. See, its essence does not change, but look at it is relevant stylistically to the era that it's trying to connect with. All right. So again, VMV, who we are, our, our spiritual DNA doesn't change, but what we want to always communicate is relevant. Now, strategic planning. As I said earlier at the beginning about this, this particular topic, Paul is always thinking forward and Jesus is always moving in ministry forward. We need to do the same. Here at First Church, it was last October that we facilitated their three-year plan. And it looked like this, and it might be that you would be interested in a three-year strategic plan. We 
launched a series of open actions with area targets. So First Church, what are your three buckets, your three targets? Anybody? Not Jeff. Your three major targets. We had an update meeting last night on those three areas. What are they? Evangelism. And next generation. So evangelism, discipleship, and the next generation. Three targets. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And we developed a plan for each of them. Uh, we branded the plan. What's the name of your three-year strategic plan? Somebody? Don't be shy. Come on. Rise up. Thank you, Charles. And your evangelism declarative is rise up to evangelism. Yeah. Rise up to love. Love. We're going to rise up to love the lost. Okay, to love. Discipleship. Rise up to? Live. Learn. Isn't it learn? It's, oh, okay, to live. To live like Jesus. All right, then the third one for the next generation is to lead, lead them to Christ. Okay, uh, and there's a, a branding of the plan. We prepared, they launched the plan this last spring. Uh, they're working on it, modifying, monitoring, mentioning because it's a road map. It's not set in steel uh, so that they can stay on mission. So you just think about what's ahead. Do we, do we move from the church into our neighborhoods? I'm just throwing stuff up on the blackboard here. Do we have more multi-site venues? Do we grow the prayer ministry of the church? Do we intentionally engage the nuns, people who want nothing to do with religion? Do we make zealously disciples of believers, really investing in this? Do we have an innovative use of space? Just throwing up on the blackboard different ideas, stirring the mind. Do we teach about comparative religions, pursue church health, because healthy things grow. If we get our church healthy, the church will grow. Do we become a good neighbor? Uh, acts of kindness ministry. Do we establish and use vision, mission, values? Do we follow a three-year strategic plan? Do we answer questions that people are actually a uh, asking? So just always thinking forward, moving ahead. So look around, look within, look ahead. Uh, and real quick here, what we discovered at E2 that if we're going to think forward so that the church can move forward, there are four key areas to jumpstart a church, just like jumpstarting a dead battery. If we want to create momentum in a church, four key areas are essential. Evangelism, discipleship,